Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. I'm Joy J. Moore. And today we welcome uh, our friend Corey Driver, uh, Dr. Corey Driver. Uh, Corey is an ordained uh, ELCA pastor, and he's serving as the assistant to the Bishop for Emerging Ministers and Ministries in the Indiana-Kentucky Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, and he's an adjunct professor of, uh, of Old Testament here at Luther Seminary, and he is contributing to the revisions on our website, enterthebible.org. So uh, the, the, that website has entries, uh, pretty extensive entries on every book of the Bible, and uh, Corey is helping us revise some of those entries uh, and adding to them, to uh, expanding on them. So we invite you to, to look at those, look at that website if you haven't seen it already, enterthebible.org. So welcome, Corey. Thank you for joining us. Thank you us. so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk some about Isaiah today. That's great. Uh, so this is the podcast on a summer series that we're suggesting uh, in the Narrative Lectionary on the book of Isaiah. Um, this is a four-part series. Um, we're suggesting that you start it on June 4th uh, of 2023, and then the last Sunday would be June 25th, 2023. But of course, you're welcome to modify those as fits into your church's schedule. But uh, Corey was, was uh, gracious enough to write uh, the commentaries uh, on those uh, on, for those four weeks on various Isaiah texts. So let's begin though with just uh, Isaiah as a whole. Uh, we you talk about this in your commentaries, Corey, but it is uh, talked about as the fifth gospel, mm -hmm. right, by the early church fathers uh, for good reason because there are lots and lots of texts uh, uh, quoted in the New Testament from Isaiah. Uh, and of course, Isaiah is a book, as you say, of, uh, about death and resurrection mm -hmm. with uh, lots, of, uh, lots of text related to Christian hope. So uh, what, what, what do you want to say about Isaiah as a whole, Corey, to introduce this series? The thing that people have been so excited about Isaiah over the times uh, is the polyvalence they're in, right? Like we have stories of community suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. But we also have all these passages about family, about personal experience, and about the larger community that have been applied absolutely to Jesus, but also Israel as a nation and a people, and then various folks as we go on through history. I'm a interpretation history kind of person. Uh, and there are lots of suffering servants, right, uh, throughout history. And that's a, that's a easy one to claim, um, though not always pleasant. Uh, and so we get to see Jesus in these passages. We get to see the people of Israel. And I think we get to see ourselves, right? The, the joy in preparing and talking about these passages for preaching is our communities have suffered and maybe gone the wrong mm. way and maybe need God's redemption and healing and resurrection. And so we get to see the kingdom of Judah. Um, we get to see the experience of the Messiah. And I think we get to see ourselves too in Isaiah. Uh, and so this is a, a fun book to preach. Uh, and four weeks is great. Uh, four years would be better, four decades even better. But um, <laughs> Isaiah has something to say, I think. And uh, it's it's a fun text. See, that's why we brought you, uh, Corey, because we appreciate your appreciation of Isaiah. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the reasons that I love Isaiah so much is uh, that, um, as you noted, Catherine, it's, it's, it's repeated over and over uh, throughout uh, the New Testament. It was um, the one book of uh, the Hebrew scriptures that seemed to carry the expression and experience for uh, ancient Israel. Mm -hmm. And so uh, both, uh, as you uh, mentioned, Corey, uh, a recognition of their suffering because of their sinfulness, um, but also in the midst of that reality, this constant hope mm -hmm. 
in the faithful promises of a faithful God. And it was so evident and such a part of their collective memory that in the, in the first century, when they encountered this Jesus, it was like, there's something about you. <laughs> and it just makes me remember the stories that we've all been told. And then the things that he did and the way that he lived out being a first century Jew caused folks to say, this is who Isaiah was talking about. This is the Messiah. And see how all of those words are embodied in this life. And so that's what we've inherited as followers of Christ. Amen. I love that. Yeah. What do what do you think, Corey? So obviously, a sermon isn't a, a history lecture mm -hmm. or a you know biblical studies lecture, but what do you think a, a preacher should or might consider saying about historical context uh, as they dive into the Book of Isaiah, say in that first week? Yeah, uh, an excellent question. Um, I think it depends on the community uh, into which the word is being preached. Uh, so we can talk about national suffering uh, as a useful background for Isaiah. Um, we can talk about inequity uh, and a lack of justice, right? There, there's a hook there, uh, certainly. We can talk about folks missing the way um, and being lost. And we can talk about any number of these things. And quite frankly, we can talk about missing God, right? Uh, that there's sort of this missed connection throughout much of Isaiah. God's saying, what, how, how are you missing me? And the people are saying, how are you missing us? Uh, and so I've been in that place, my own life and experience where I feel like God and I are asking each other, where are you? Uh, and so hmm. there's any number of historical tie-ins depending on how the preacher wants to address these passages, um, but any number of those and still others. What do y'all think? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely true to, re to refer to kind of personal history or congregational history. Perhaps talk a bit about the situation of Israel as, or Judah in this case, obviously, as a very small nation amongst empires mm. and th constantly threatened by empires. Uh, and then so that the, so that the word of j both judgment and promise come to a people who are in a precarious situation, uh, just historically speaking, you know, in, in the wider context without making it into, you know, a history of biblical times or, or the ancient Near East, but just to, just to, I, my, I know my students uh, appreciate being reminded, or, or, or I think they do anyway, that <laughs> Israel, that Judah is more like, say, Guatemala than it is like the United mm -hmm. States, right? That it's, uh, that it's a small nation surrounded by much larger empires. And I think that helps give them a perspective uh, into especially the claim that comes later in Isaiah of, uh, well, throughout Isaiah, really, but especially in the latter part about God's sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? That that the God of this tiny nation is the God of the whole universe and the only God. I mean, that's a, we kind of take that claim for granted, I think, but but to, to know the boldness of that claim coming from a little tiny nation like Israel or Judah, uh, that's, uh, I think, it's helpful to remember how bold that claim is that our God is the God, the only God. So I, be, because I love to work with words, um, let me, let me kind of describe the, um, the circumstance that you were referencing, Corey, uh, with a little bit more uh, specificity. Mm -hmm. Unrest in the Middle East, warring, political factions, allegations of sexual assault, actually naming our beloved ce celebrities, mm -hmm. rumors of war, irregular weather patterns, economic collapse, social unrest, 
adverse employment practices, mistreatment of the elderly, incest, bribery, forged, forced labor, global disease, divorce, domestic violence, increased child sacrifice, adultery, multiple sex partners. Mm -hmm. When I read the first chapter of Isaiah, I think someone has inserted an ancient text into the teleprompters of the network news because I was describing that text, that context that you were talking about, Catherine, but it sure sounded like I was reading the latest Twitter, Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Just maybe a half hour ago, as I was doing my final prep, I was reading chapter one and thought, where's my sandwich board? Right? Like I, I got a, there's an apocalypse on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's move into particular texts. Uh, week one, uh, and again, we're suggesting that this would be uh, June fourth uh, of 2023. Uh, and the text that we that that's been assigned is Isaiah chapter six, verses one through eight, with the option of adding verses nine through thirteen. And this is, of course, a very famous passage in Isaiah, the uh, the call story, you mm -hmm. might say, of Isaiah. I love how you uh, the the kind of subtitle you put. On your commentary, Corey, the, the first step is admitting we have a problem. <laughs> that's good. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that's what's going on here, right? Um, we get prologue and introduction prior to this, but this is the real beginning of the book of Isaiah in a lot of ways. And it is the acknowledgement of a problem, right? God is holding forth in the heavenly place, which can barely stand God's holiness, right? The foundations are shaking, uh, the seraphim are hiding and uh, doing their thing. And it looks like even heaven's about to crack apart. And into that is thrust this human, Isaiah. And his first movement is self-criticism. Woe hmm. to me, I'm a person of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips, right? I am in trouble, right? It's bad enough that God sees us on earth. Here I am in heaven in God's home place. I am in a lot of trouble. And this is admitting the problem that we've been talking about in the chapters prior to this, but here it is in personal experience confronted with, oh, this is who God is and this is who I am. And the great good news, right? Because in Isaiah, we can never separate the problem from the solution uh, very far, is that God's already thought of this, right? And, and the angel goes and takes the uh, fire piece uh, from the altar and touches it to Isaiah's lips. God knows Isaiah is a person of unclean lips from people of unclean lips and has a plan. And begins immediately after the recognition of, oh no, we're in trouble. We are not saying the things, maybe we're not eating the things uh, that God wants us to do. We are not being faithful to God and loving of neighbor. We've got a problem. And God says, I know, I know. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you about that. And I'd like you to talk to the others about that. Uh, and so a beautiful introduction to not just the rest of Isaiah, but the theology of Isaiah that God knows and God's going to do something about it and wants the humans to do something about it too. And, and calls uh, on humans. So uh, I'm looking at verse mm -hmm. eight. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Beautiful. Uh, several songs written uh, with that, uh, particularly the Here Am I, Send Me. Uh, Here that, I am, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it I, Lord? Okay. I'm glad you did that. Y'all didn't have me on this podcast to sing. I, that's, that was a beautiful <laughs> voice, not like what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Here, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. In the night. Yeah. So um, it just strikes me as a as a, a, a big turnaround, right, from woe is me, 
uh, I'm lost for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I loved how you put it, Corey, that, that God already knows that and God takes care of it, right? God is the one who, who um, purifies, uh, you know, now, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And it's in the wake of that forgiveness, that, uh, that, that redemption, uh, that Isaiah is able to say, here am I, send mm -hmm. me. I know my, you know, I know my faults. I know my sin uh, and my guilt is ever before me, you might say, uh, but uh, in the words of the liturgy, but here am I. Mm -hmm. I, I'm ready to ready to be used. Yeah, I feel like maybe one of the top ten themes, and there's so many of Isaiah, is once God does a thing, it is done. Right? Uh, there's all this call to remember the works of God, or here I am doing this thing. Do you not see it? Right? God acts, and then check it off the list. Right? And so Isaiah is this prophet because he gets what God is doing. Right? And there's no sense pretending lips have not been burned once they have, right? Uh, and so that quick turnaround is the introduction to the prophet Isaiah, because he's going to have to make a lot of quick turnarounds uh, presented with new information and new action. Yeah. The, uh, that, that recognition, too, that um, it's not just humanity speaks, um, uh, bears false witness or um, offers praise to idols, or I'm thinking of the ways that we have unclean lips. Um, there are other things that we are guilty of. And when we, when we see the glory of God, we recognize, whoa, I'm not an image of that. I'm not reflecting that. And as you just said, Corey, what God has done in, in this particular section, it's God has spoken and we aren't speaking what God has spoken. Um, over and over as we go through this book, God is speaking, calling out and offering hope, off, offering redemption, which in this moment is experienced so that Isaiah can actually bear witness to I've heard God's voice, I've seen God work, and I'm reminding you, as God has reminded me, that this is our story. And I, you, you introduced verse uh, eight there, uh, Catherine. What I love is the timing of when Isaiah hears the voice of God. He's in the presence of holiness, and he overhears the praise offered to mm -hmm. God. But it is not until he receives the forgiveness that he hears that God is looking for someone. And then he is able to stop navel gazing because God has taken care of his sin. And he can say, here am I, Lord, send me. And I know it's a question of whether we do the next few verses. Um, but uh, as you said, Corey, that quick turnaround what Isaiah is actually asked to do. If you stop there, it's beautiful. Oh yes, God forgives, God calls. We say yes and we're on it. And then, and then we keep reading and it's like, okay, so what am I supposed to do? Everything you do, the people you're doing it for are not gonna get it. The words you say, they're not gonna understand. They're not gonna hear when you speak. They're not gonna see what you show them. Okay, wait a minute. This is a bigger task than I had in mind. I, I wonder if this isn't the prophetic technique of Jonah, right? Um, oh, you yeah. come in and you say, look, 40 more days and Nineveh is going to be destroyed. There's no ifs, there's no ands. That's the message. And it provokes repentance. Who knows, but God might be gracious with us, right? And Isaiah is to speak this message so that people will be ununderstanding, right? So that they will not hear. But I think that that's kind of how God works, right? Like very canny, very insightful, you know, as the creator of all the earth and everything, um, to say, 
maybe I'll get them this way, right? Like this hasn't worked and that hasn't worked. I did the whole garden thing, right? In chapter five. So here's what- And they walked out. Yeah, here's what we're gonna do. 40 more days and Nineveh is gonna be destroyed or an unnumbered number of days and then Jerusalem's gonna be destroyed. How do you like that, right? Maybe that will work. And we we do have this sort of almost experimental version of prophecy in Isaiah. We're going to try it this way. And we're going to try it that way. And I'm going to give this message and then I'm going to give that message. And they might sound even opposite. But this is um, the God who pursues, right? And I'm going to come at you this way and it might work. I'm going to come at you that way. How do you respond? Uh, and so... This is how we see God acting several times, right? To say, I'm going to tell them and they might take this, but they might not. So I'll tell them this other way too, right? And that's why we have all these prophetic voices and all the different prophecies throughout this book. Uh, And so if you put one chapter of Isaiah with another chapter of Isaiah, it's like, is this even the same? same. Uh, Yes, Mm. it is uh, because this is how we see God working. Well, that's probably a a good segue. And it's an important question because that that does, you're right, Joy. uh, It it sounds really beautiful. And then the prophecy is a good word. Yeah. But I'm afraid we need to move on to those uh, other chapters of Isaiah. So for week two, uh, the text is Isaiah chapter nine, just a few chapters later. Uh, verses 1 through 7, uh, and this is what we're suggesting for June 11th. Uh, and it's another uh, well-known passage from Isaiah uh, that is quoted in the, New- in the New Testament. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this seems like a much more hopeful prophecy <laughs> than what we ended with in Isaiah nine. Um, what do you, uh, you you talk, Corey, in your commentary about light amongst shadows? Uh, that after a communal tragedy, of course, there's shadows of despair. Uh, but Isaiah promises a light here, uh, and you uh, say that he's probably referring to King Hezekiah. Do you want to say just a word about Hezekiah? and how he fits into Judaism. Yeah, absolutely. This is the week of the four where I'd say dig into the history the most uh, because that helps ground the experience of prophecy and the experience of promise. Uh, So Hezekiah is this reformer, um, political, economic, spiritual to be sure, uh, reformer who welcomes refugees from the north uh, after uh, Sennacherib, uh, basically crushes the the northern kingdom of Israel and invites everybody to say, look, maybe you turned away. Welcome back. Here's how we do things mm. in the South, right? The South has got something to say, and here it is, and we're going to celebrate our festivals, and we got a temple and all that. Um, and we only worship the one God, by the way. Um, so he is this reformer, but he doesn't get a pass, right? And uh, the the... Book of Isaiah turns on Hezekiah being stupid, if we can say it, right? Uh, and sharing too much uh, and giving too much information to the people who will ultimately come and destroy the southern kingdom of Judah. And so we have all the, the Babylonians. Yeah, yeah. We have all this hope built up in Hezekiah, particularly as he is a light to Galilee of the Gentiles. Right to Zebulon and Naphtali, mm-hmm. these people who have been crushed are the exact people that Hezekiah is going to take care of. Um, mm-hmm. So, Second uh, Chronicles thirty is is like the story of welcoming these folks, saying, you know, it went badly for you. Uh, I'm not going to say I told you so, but welcome, right? And so, if we see this hope of Hezekiah. In Isaiah 9, we also need to be aware that it's short-lived, right? There's all this promise, all this desire. Hey, things are going to be great. And there's all this trust put in a human leader who then lets people down and is not what the folks were looking for. And to carry this forward to Jesus, because, you know, Christians want to talk about Jesus. 
Especially with texts like this. Especially oh, with yeah. texts like this. A child has been born for us, a son given to us, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. In the Gospels, folks are disappointed with Jesus all the time. When are you going to fight the Romans, right? When are we going to break the rod of our oppressors? Uh, we've read about this stuff. Hey, we're in Galilee. Uh, any chance in throwing out, you know, everybody we don't like? No, that's that's not what Jesus comes to do. Uh, and that is a great problem again and again in the gospel. So I think the challenge and invitation for this week, preaching Isaiah 9, is to say, God's promises are good and true. How do we see those playing out? And how do we be honest with God, right? Scripture is full of people saying, this doesn't seem like what you promised, God. I'm going to lament. Mm-hmm. I'm going to challenge. And that is not an unchristian or unbiblical response, but to say, I have to hold these promises that you're making for me and for us and for, you know, everybody, even the people we don't necessarily like. But I have to hold my own integrity, right? Uh, you know, Catherine will always go back to the book of Job, right? How do you be a person in relationship with God who is not system, but God who is God, right? Mm, mm, And it might mm. work out great and it might not. God's promises remain. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yes, multiplying the nation by presumably welcoming refugees, right? Increasing joy and naming children after who God is. Uh, absolutely. This child will be a sign, but when this child grows up and it, I, I'm saying it's probably Hezekiah in the first reading and then betrays the Southern kingdom to Babylon by giving a tour of all the uh, treasures you might want to loot. Yeah. Know. What, uh, what do you years. do then? Uh, and mm. so, I think it's an invitation to the preacher to dig in and do some Christology in front of people. Jesus Mm -hmm. saves absolutely how and from what. And let's be really honest and intentional about examining that Hezekiah saved for sure. Hezekiah saved, but how and from what? And so let's handle the texts that we're given carefully and lovingly and with integrity to say, absolutely, right? A wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. Jesus was killed. Jesus was executed. All of his followers were too, right? How do we hold those things together? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Corey, I really appreciate it two things that you did here. One is just the, the fact that you're telling this story of hope and promise and Christology, but you're not leaning it into the birth narrative. And so often we refer to this passage during uh, the Christmas season and telling the Christmas story. And I think the power of this, uh, these stories uh, from ancient Israel's history to help them to be able to recognize Jesus when Jesus walked on earth was the fact that the stories themselves revealed the promise and faithfulness of God. And sometimes what we've done is we've taken snippets and assigned them to portions, so we almost wouldn't recognize if God showed up in the flesh today, much like the first century followers didn't recognize this Moses, this Abraham mm-hmm. that was before them, this Messiah. And so I, I, I challenge uh, our, our pastors not to do a summer Christmas but to stay with the story of Isaiah and to allow this ancient uh, stories, events, episodes, history to be so clearly laid out that folks understand just how precarious it is to hold to the truth promises of God in the midst 
of a not yet moment, mm. which is where we live until Christ returns. Exactly. I, that's that's the gift of this. Not to say, hey, you know, all good and you know, sh- sunshine and rainbows. This is right. preaching right. to us if we let it. I, I think this really goes back to what you said at the uh, very beginning of the podcast about the polyvalence of the the biblical text as well, right? Because you you're right, Joy. You know, we hear handle. I hear handle mm-hmm. Messiah, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We hear this text mostly in Advent, maybe exclusively in Advent, um, and so we can talk, or the preacher can talk about Hezekiah and. Jesus, right? It's not a, it, it's a, it's a yes and kind of thing uh, that, and and I think your comparison, Corey, of Hezekiah and Jesus and the expectations uh, can, could be a really fruitful way to approach that text. If Alas, we have to move on to, oh yes, go ahead. 20, 20 seconds. Um, I think yes. <laughs> if the preacher has a long time to fill, if, if the congregation wants that 40 minute sermon, finally, um, I think a good note is to think about medieval use of these passages and to talk about Shabbatai Zvi and Jacob Frank and failed messiahs, right? People who lead folk the wrong way and say, you know, today, do we have any failed messiahs? Do we have any folk mm-hmm. who we might think the government's on their shoulders, but, you know, maybe it shouldn't be, right? And yeah. uh, this can be very useful for helping ourselves to see, look, Hezekiah wasn't it in as much as he was mostly, but he wasn't all the way. And to help turn our gaze toward Jesus away from heroes who are going to let us down. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's, that's worth the 20 Thank seconds. Good, Absolutely. Good Thank word. Uh, so week three, uh, talking June 18th and the text, another really uh, familiar one, beautiful one, Isaiah 40, uh, verses 1 through 11. This is the beginning of what scholars call second Isaiah. That is probably not from the 8th century uh, Isaiah of Jerusalem, uh, but from the exilic times uh, in the uh, the 6th century. So, uh, but you don't necessarily have to go into that in your sermon. I just want to acknowledge that. But uh, chapter 40, uh, we turn from uh, judgment in chapter 6 to this beautiful, beautiful passage of comfort, uh, comfort, oh, comfort my people. Uh, but it's worth noting that that even in Isaiah 40, even in this beautiful uh, passage, the situation is still precarious, right? They're not back in uh, back in the land. They are in, uh, in Babylon. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're in exile. They're away from, uh, from Jerusalem, away from Judah. Um, which makes that comfort, uh, I suppose, uh, even more profound. Yeah, absolutely. If I jump in, um, I really appreciate it that we talked about Hezekiah and folks who know Hezekiah's chapter is 39, right before this comfort chapter. And everything that you were describing, Corey, is, is why recognizing this time gap that Catherine just lifted up is important Mm -hmm. because what you have as we were in six, chapter six, talking, uh, excuse me, chapter nine, talking about um, this this, uh, promise, one who has done all of these great things, which is actually who Isaiah was, the king that died, Mm -hmm. that enabled Isaiah to look beyond the earthly king to see the holy Mm. king. And and so that theme is played over again. In 39, we have um, Israel at their their top of their game. Um, It's as if Hezekiah is about to to, uh, negotiate peace in the Middle East. And he is so excited to tell the prophet, look at what I've done. And the prophet only hears, as you said, only hears that you've just told everybody our stuff. Mm-hmm. You, you just let, and, and there's going to be a consequence for that. That wasn't your role, Hezekiah. So at Israel's best moment, they are judged. And that judgment leads to exile, which is that time frame that Catherine just 
made prominent for us between uh, the, 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 the time of, of, of being in exile and waiting and waiting and wanting. And then in the midst of suffering, in the midst of exile, they hear these words, which are yet a promise. Mm. Your time has been fulfilled. You're still there, but God remembers you. God is faithful. Joy, I really appreciate that note of human roles and God's role. I feel like what I want to draw out for the preacher in Isaiah 40 is God's role, right? That this highway that's being made is for God to travel on. Verse 3, um, verse 10, verse 11. This is not for the people to come back from exile, at least originally. This is for God to go get them, right? This is mm. God who comes to you. God as a shepherd who comes and gathers the lambs. God says, look, y'all are still in the mess. I want two things for you, comfort and rescue. So I'm going to tell you comfort right now, and you all are going to announce it to each other, right? In this chapter, God is instructing comfort, oh, comfort my people, right? Put a, a messenger on a high hill, right? That God wants the people to tell themselves, look, this is what God it says God will do. Let's share the promise. Meanwhile, God's coming. God's going to come get you. Right. And so the valleys are lifted up, the mountains are made low so that God can come to God's people. I think this is, if any place else, a place to talk about Jesus. Right. Because of how this passage is used, right? Like talking about a way in the wilderness. Uh, when we talk about John the Baptizer, right? The way in the wilderness is not for humans to come out from Jerusalem. Uh, the way is for Jesus to come to the people, right? Mm -hmm. And the way in Isaiah is for God first to travel on, to gather the people and to bring them back, right? Um, my favorite metaphor, if I can use a little bit of privilege, um, for the divine human relationship is that of Goel, right? The kinsperson redeemer, right? If you sell yourself into trouble, uh, be it sin and death or simply economic debt, if you are captured because you don't have enough strength, if you are left without a name, the kinsperson redeemer is responsible, no matter what y'all did, for coming and rescuing you. And this is how we see God here, right? I warned you. I warned you. I warned you, y'all did the thing, be that as it may. Y'all have had consequences. I'm coming to get you, right? And so God takes it upon God's self to come to where the people are, rescue them and bring them back to God's self, to live with God's self. And if that ain't the gospel, I don't know what it is. That's really beautiful, Corey. I love that insight. And I, I have to say, I don't, I had not noticed that before, but you're right. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Because, mm -hmm. of course, later in what, uh, chapter 43, mm -hmm. is it? Or uh, the the way is made in the wilderness for the people to come back. But you're right. In chapter 40, it's for God to go rescue the people, to go redeem the people. Um, so, yeah. And it fits well, I think, with what we said about the first week's text in Isaiah 6, where it's God, again, who acts uh, to, to cleanse the prophet's lips, uh, and, it's, and it's God's call that comes to the prophet. It's God's action. Mm -hmm. uh, God is the subject of the verbs here. And it's, uh, and it's as a goel, you're right. If our listeners are interested, you probably already know this, but uh, there's a lot about the goel, the kinsman redeemer, uh, in Leviticus 25 in the laws about jubilee. Uh, and in other texts in the Pentateuch, but particularly Leviticus 25. So, so God acts as redeemer, God acts as shepherd uh, to, uh, to, to, to rescue, to redeem. And yeah. in God's action, God calls for preaching, 
God calls for proclamation. Yes. Lift up yeah. your voice. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Tell the people what I'm doing. And so, again, this goes back to Isaiah 6, right? God is going to do the thing and wants humans to tell each other about it. Um, and so we Amen. get to partner. So encouragement preachers, uh, yes. God's looking at you. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in, the encur- in the encouragement is that we get to announce what God is doing. Amen. We get to witness, we get to experience, and we get to announce. It's not our doing, mm-hmm. but once you've seen it, once you've experienced it, then you can't keep it to yourself. Oh, wait a minute. That's a different prophet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Encouragement for preachers. Uh, how beautiful are the feet of those? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the uh, the text. Well, anyway, uh, cry out. I said, what shall I cry? Uh, o Zion, herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Yeah. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your mm-hmm. God. Yeah, let's be. Behold, beautiful. your Lord will come. Right? That's yeah. the. Yeah. yeah. And thank you to our working preachers for uh, for, for answering that. Amen. Call. Amen. Uh, let's move on to week four. So uh, in week four, we're moving to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. And here, uh, uh, more uh, good news of deliverance. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted. Uh, It is uh, no coincidence, of course, uh, that this is the text that Jesus preaches on uh, in Luke chapter 4 in his first uh, sermon in Nazareth, in the synagogue at Nazareth. Uh, And he's talking, speaking of Leviticus 25, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that's the year of mm-hmm. Jubilee, right? The, the year of Jubilee, uh, the, the day, uh, the year of the Lord's favor to provide the, for those who mourn in Zion, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. That's what Jubilee is, right? Debts forgiven, uh, people coming home again, um, uh, prisoners released. Land return, inequity abolished. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all, all of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very concrete stuff, right? For people who have been suffering under empire and who have been displaced in exile and who have been waiting to be restored. Chicken in the kitchen. Yeah, I am where I am. <laughs> Sorry, what? Ham where I and am. Chicken in the kitchen. Yeah. Tomatoes on my table. There's ain't no pie in the sky, right? It's here. It's here. <laughs> I am not familiar with that uh, song. <laughs> uh, yeah, very kind of pre- preached. I haven't heard it sung. I've heard okay, it. Preached. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. What do you want to say about this text? I please? love the reversals uh, and the progress. Right. So it's good news to the humble and to the brokenhearted and the captives and the prisoners. Hooray! But then they become the ministers, right? You will be my ministers. I'm at verse six. Uh, You will eat the wealth of nations. You boast. God loves justice. And the justice pictured here is not just freedom for the captives, if that were not enough. Um, They are new, right? Uh, But to say, (laughs) I'm going to take you all as my people. And I want you to do my work and I want you to be identified with me and I'm going to lift you up. Uh, So if we have this overarching narrative of suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension in the book of Isaiah, this is the ascension part, right? There's all this raising up, right? You come out of the hole in which you have been held, right? Subterranean prisons or whatever. And then I'm going to lift you up even further. I'm going to set you up as somebody I want talking to other folks, telling about who I am, right? And so this notion of God freeing people is one part, and then God turns them into ministers. God turns them into the folk responsible for telling others about the one true God, right? And A kind of great commission. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. 
Ricky Watts um, has done this incredible book um, called um, um, Isaiah's um, New Exodus mm. in Mark. Isaiah's New Exodus in Mark. And what he does is he reads the Gospel of Mark with the promises of Isaiah in light of the Exodus. Mm. So the, the stories that are of the people of God start with liberation. You just mentioned that, Corey. Liberation and then um, promise of a complete fulfillment and then that promise revealed in Jesus, right? So Exodus, Isaiah, Mark. But what your comments just make me think about, uh, Corey, uh, when you were talking about this reversal that we have uh, as we move into this ascension moment of, 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 of chapter 61 and moving, um, is that after the Exodus, where God literally destroyed the greatest empire and, and moved nature mm -hmm. to free the captives, what they did was to take on the exact same system and to put themselves over the people that they could influence. And so they became the captors. Mm -hmm. That was not God's right. plan. And so what you have here is, okay, I'm setting you free, like you said, Corey, as if that isn't enough, but I'm reminding you of why you were created in the first place. When the call was given to Abraham and Sarah, your descendants will be a blessing, not a captive, not a system of power over. Your people will be the blessing for all people. And so this chapter 61 is saying, you've experienced this freedom and now you will offer that freedom to others. It is an incredible reversal for human experience but it is a demonstration of the faithfulness of God because this was God's intention from the creation in the garden. Absolutely. The, going back to what Catherine was saying, the year of the Lord is not supposed to be a one-time thing. It happens again and again and again because we need that, right? And so God invites, uh, and maybe a little stronger verb than invites, uh, folks into being ministers of justice, of righteousness, right? This is not, hey, you're good, go and relax. This is, hey, you're good, let's tell people and let's perform mm -hmm. God's justice. Let's perform God's righteousness so that this song spreads out, right? In, in the latter parts of Isaiah, you get this song language that you will sing a song of freedom that catches mm -hmm. on that hmm. it's not just, okay, we're going to abolish prisons. Awesome. Let's do that. But then let's, when everybody's out, let's perform righteousness so that people aren't hmm. going to prison, right? Let's hmm. do the work hmm. because of who we have seen God to be. We have this communal experience of death and resurrection and now ascension. Let's keep on doing that. Right. Uh, and, I think that's how we get to Jesus again to say, look, we're called into something else. Isaiah is a cool story, but unless we make it our story through the power and example of Christ, it's just a cool story, right? It's just a cool story. Yeah. But yeah. And what, if, sorry. We need that. We need that liberation right. and we need that living into the righteousness that God calls. So we cannot, accept liberation as enough. Exactly. Exactly. It, it becomes our responsibility. And I, I love that you highlight that it becomes a song language and, mm -hmm. you know, like the Pied Piper people can join mm -hmm. in. And Catherine, so often what folks want to do is to miss that because they throw out the one book that offers us this great liberation and this great worship, which is the book of Leviticus. It's all in Leviticus. That's where you have the princely worship, and it's where you have the promise of justice in ways that are just clear and, 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 and unashamed. And so this idea for us is what Jesus says when John's disciples come, and they say, 
And John wants to know, are you the one or are we supposed to look for another? And what does Jesus say? Tell them what you've seen that mm -hmm. I've done. What do people say about the church today mm -hmm. in the 21st century when they say, is the answer of this creator good God the people of God? What do we say? What have you seen? What have we done? And unless what we can say looks like this promise from Isaiah, looks like this first sermon of Jesus, not the words we speak, mm -hmm. but the life we've lived, then it's, it's our liberation, but it's not good news for the world. And that's just not enough. Yeah. What does it mean to be wrapped in a robe of righteousness, as this text says, right? Like, not to put it on, not to experience, but to wear it. Well, I'm afraid we've probably come to the end of our time. Uh, just want to thank you so much, Corey, for both for your, your written commentary and for uh, being with us on the podcast. You've just uh, helped open up uh, new vistas in Isaiah. We really appreciate your scholarship and your your faithful interpretation. So thank you so much. A great much. pleasure. Thanks for staying with Thank you all. Yeah. And uh, uh, for more on um, the narrative lectionary, of course, there's always uh, more podcasts here on workingpreacher.com. Thank you for joining us to our listeners and uh, blessings on your proclamation of this good news. Have a great summer. Thanks, y'all.